I'm glad you could join us. Go ahead and stab the like button and stick around for the next untold story. It was a sweltering August afternoon when Tom and his friends decided to escape the city's stifling heat and head for the old Quarry Lake just outside town. Known locally as Widow's Deep, the lake had a chilling history and was rumored to be bottomless, with tales of strange disappearances and eerie happenings that had kept most locals at bay. The idea of diving into its cool, mysterious waters, however, proved too tempting on such a scorching day. The group consisted of Tom, his girlfriend Lisa, and their friends Mark and Jenna. They packed their coolers with drinks and snacks, grabbed their swim gear, and set off in high spirits, eager for relief from the relentless heat. The drive to Widow's Deep took them through dense woods, the road narrowing as they ventured further from civilization. Upon arrival, the quarry presented a breathtaking view. Cliffs of sheer rock bordered it on three sides, casting long shadows across the lake's surface. The water itself was a deep, dark blue, almost black, reflecting the sky above. Despite the beauty, there was an undeniable stillness that hung in the air, a silence that seemed almost unnatural. Eager to shake off the eerie feeling, the group quickly set up their spot near the water's edge. Tom and Mark were the first to dive in, the cool water a welcome respite from the heat. Lisa and Jenna followed, laughing and splashing around, for a while, the group enjoyed themselves, their laughter echoing off the quarry walls, filling the air with life. As the sun began to dip below the trees, casting the quarry into shadows, Mark proposed a diving contest from one of the lower cliffs. Always up for a challenge, Tom agreed, and they clambered up the rocky face to a ledge about 15 feet above the water. Jenna decided to sit this one out, but Lisa, ever the adventurer, joined the boys. From below, Jenna shouted up a countdown, and on three, Tom and Lisa leaped off the cliff side by side. Mark hesitated, a sudden nervousness gripping him, but then jumped as well, a few seconds after the others. Tom plunged into the cold depths, the water enveloping him in its dark embrace. When he resurfaced, gasping for air, Lisa was already swimming back to shore, laughing about the thrill. But when Tom looked around for Mark, he couldn't see him anywhere. Mark! Tom called out, treading water and scanning the surface. Lisa joined in, calling Mark's name, her voice tinged with concern. There was no sign of him, no splashing or swimming movements in the water. Panic began to set in as the seconds stretched into minutes. Tom dived under, hoping to catch a glimpse of Mark below the surface. The water was murkily dark, visibility low, and the more he looked, the more disoriented he became. Suddenly, he felt something brush against his leg, something cold and slimy that moved away into the deeper water. Surfacing, Tom yelled for Jenna to call for help. Jenna, who had been sunbathing a little away from the shore, rushed over, her expression turning to horror as she realized the situation. She fished out her phone and dialed 911, her hands shaking. As the group waited in terror, the water remained eerily calm, as if nothing had happened. The sun had now set completely, and the quarry was enveloped in darkness, the only light coming from their small campfire near the shore. With every minute that passed, the quarry seemed to grow darker and more foreboding. Tom and Lisa continued to search the water, refusing to give up. But as they swam near the center of the lake, a thick fog began to roll over the surface, reducing their visibility to nearly zero. As they called out for Mark, their voices seemed muffled by the fog, absorbed by the lake. It was then that they heard it, a faint splashing sound, not far from where they were. They swam towards it, hopeful, but as they reached the spot, they found nothing but the cold, dark water swirling around them. Tom felt a growing sense of dread, a feeling that the water below was hiding something ancient and malevolent. As he and Lisa huddled together in the water, waiting for help to arrive, the true terror of Widow's Deep was slowly beginning to reveal itself, and the night had only just begun. The cold enveloped Tom and Lisa as they tread water, the chilling grip of Widow's Deep seemingly tightening with every passing moment. The fog thickened, weaving around them like a living entity, its tendrils obscuring the rocky cliffs and dimming the light from their small campfire on the shore. Jenna's calls from the bank, urging them to come back, sounded distant and distorted, as if muffled by an unseen force. 
Their shouts for Mark became desperate cries, echoing into the void, answered only by the soft lap of water against the cliffside. Time seemed to stretch and distort, the boundary between minutes and hours blurring in their mounting panic. Every sound was magnified, the slight splash of water, the distant rustle of leaves in the forest beyond, and their own labored breathing. As they clung to each other, a sudden movement beneath the water sent a shock of fear through them. Something large had brushed against Tom's leg again, more forceful this time, like a silent warning. Lisa screamed, gripping Tom tighter. The water around them rippled unnervingly as though something or someone was moving just below the surface. We need to get back to the shore, Tom gasped, pulling Lisa with him as he started to swim back. The fog seemed to swirl angrily at their decision, closing in tighter as if to push them back toward the center of the lake. When they finally reached the shore, Jenna was waiting, her face ghostly pale in the flickering firelight. She had spoken to the emergency services. Help was on its way, but might take time due to the remote location and the dense fog. Tom and Lisa collapsed on the bank, shivering and drenched, their minds reeling from the encounter in the water. No sooner had they caught their breath than a strange, hollow sound pierced the night. A deep, mournful groaning that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. The sound vibrated through the ground, unsettling and unnatural. Jenna, Tom, and Lisa exchanged terrified glances, the sound reigniting their fear. What was that? Jenna whispered, her voice trembling. Before anyone could answer, the groaning intensified, accompanied by a series of small tremors that shook the ground beneath them. The lake surface began to churn violently, water splashing onto the bank, as if something below was struggling to break free. Frozen with fear, the trio could only watch as the center of the lake bubbled and frothed. Suddenly, the water burst upward in a massive surge, and for a brief horrifying moment, they saw it. A massive shadowy figure, its form obscured and distorted by the splashing water. It was too quick, too surreal to fully comprehend, but it imprinted a visceral terror on their minds before it crashed back into the lake, disappearing into the dark water. The night fell silent once more, the tremors subsiding and the lake gradually calming. The fog began to slowly dissipate, revealing the stark, eerie beauty of Widow's Deep once again. But the peace was superficial. The air was thick with the heavy weight of unanswered questions and fear. Is it gone? Lisa asked, her voice barely audible. I don't know, Tom replied, staring out at the water, his eyes searching for any sign of movement. But we can't stay here. We need to move away from the water. And gathering their remaining strength, they collected their belongings and moved to a higher part of the rocky cliff, away from the water's edge. They huddled together, watching, waiting for the emergency services to arrive, and for dawn to break. The night seemed endless, each minute stretching into eternity as they kept their watch over the still troubled waters of Widow's Deep. The terror of what they had witnessed, and the uncertainty of what might still lurk beneath the seemingly tranquil surface, kept them wide awake, jumping at every sound, every slight movement in the dark. The horror of the night was far from over, and as they waited in silence, the ominous presence of the lake hung over them, a dark reminder that some mysteries are better left undiscovered. As they waited, huddled together on the cold, rocky cliff above Widow's Deep, the initial shock of what they had witnessed began to give way to a numbing fear. The fog that had once shrouded the lake began to lift, but the darkness of the night seemed to grow denser, a tangible cloak of dread that settled over everything. Tom, Lisa, and Jenna kept their eyes fixed on the still water, the surface of which now lay eerily calm, as if the lake were holding its breath. The fire they had started earlier flickered weakly, casting long, dancing shadows that played tricks on their eyes. Every rustle of wind, every crackle of the fire, sent shivers down their spines. The sound of an approaching vehicle broke the tense silence, its headlights cutting through the last remnants of fog. Relief washed over the group momentarily, but as the vehicle drew closer, they realized something was wrong. The lights were too high, the engine too loud for the standard emergency vehicles that serviced their town. The truck that rolled into view was old and battered, its body covered in patches of rust and grime. It came to a halt a short distance from their camp, and two large, burly men stepped out. They didn't look like any rescue team the group had ever seen. Clad in heavy boots and dirty jeans, the men carried thick ropes and hooks their expressions hidden under the brim of their hats. Looks like you folks could use some help, 
one of the men called out, his voice gruff, carrying an unsettling cheerfulness. Tom stood up, nodding warily. We called for help, but who are you? Just some locals who know the area well, the other man replied, stepping closer. We know all about Widow's Deep here, dangerous place to swim, especially at night. The men's eyes weren't friendly. There was a hardness to them, a cold calculation that made Tom's stomach churn. We didn't swim, Tom said quickly. We just want to get our friend. He's missing. The men exchanged glances, an unspoken communication passing between them. Missing, you say? The first man chuckled darkly. Many go missing around here. Few ever leave. Lisa grabbed Tom's arm, her intuition screaming that they were in real danger. These men weren't here to help. They were part of something darker, perhaps as dark as the lake itself. We need to leave, she whispered urgently to Tom. Before they could move, the second man lifted his hand, signaling behind them. From the darkness, more figures emerged, surrounding the group quickly and silently. Panic surged as they realized they were trapped, the newcomers forming a tight circle around them. Widow's Deep demands a tribute, the first man said, his voice no longer friendly but cold and menacing. And tonight, it seems it called to you. The group backed together as the men closed in, their ropes and hooks glinting in the firelight. Tom, Lisa, and Jenna fought back, their screams echoing across the lake, but their efforts were futile against the strength of their captors. As they were dragged toward the edge of the water, the surface began to churn violently once more, as if anticipating their arrival. The dark figure they had seen earlier rose again from the depths, its form massive and shadowy, the water around it swirling with hungry anticipation. The last thing Tom saw before he was thrown into the cold, dark waters was the moon, a thin crescent barely visible through the thick clouds, indifferent to the horrors unfolding below. His scream was cut short as the water enveloped him, the dark figure pulling him deeper into the abyss of Widow's Deep. The lake calmed quickly after that, the surface smooth and undisturbed, as if nothing had happened. The men watched for a moment longer, then turned back to their truck, leaving the silent lake to its secrets. Widow's Deep had claimed its tribute, and the night reclaimed its eerie peace, the whispers of the past and the lost echoing softly in the chill wind. On a balmy summer evening, Casey and her friend Megan decided to explore the old Fairwood Mansion, a long-abandoned property at the edge of their small coastal town. The mansion, notorious for its mysterious past and the eerie incidents reported by those daring enough to venture near it, had been a favorite topic of local legends and ghost stories. They had always been curious about the mansion, and the thrill of a summer adventure was too enticing to resist. Armed with flashlights, cameras, and a healthy dose of skepticism, they made their way through the thick underbrush that had overgrown the path leading to the mansion. As they approached, the sun began to set, casting long shadows and bathing the dilapidated structure in an ominous glow. The once grand mansion now stood derelict, its windows shattered and its walls marred by time and neglect. Ignoring the chill that seemed to settle around the property, Casey and Megan entered through a creaky, half-off hinge door. Inside, the air was cool and musty, filled with the scent of mold and decay. Their flashlights pierced the darkness, revealing a grand foyer blanketed in dust and debris. The walls were lined with portraits of the Fairwood family, their faces faded, but still watching from their frames with solemn, hollow eyes. As they explored the ground floor, the remnants of luxury and decay mingled together. Torn upholstery, a grand piano with missing keys, and a chandelier that hung precariously low from a rotting ceiling fixture. The atmosphere was heavy, each room telling a story of a past both grand and tragic. The girls dared each other to venture further, pushing deeper into the mansion's heart. They descended into the basement, the air growing colder as they went down. The basement was darker, the light from their flashlights seeming to struggle against the oppressive blackness. In the basement, they found an old library filled with moldy books and broken shelves. As they examined the titles, a cold draft swept through the room, sending shivers down their spines. The sensation of being watched grew stronger. The silence of the mansion punctuated only by their own breathing and the distant sound of the ocean waves crashing against the cliffs nearby. It was then that they heard it. A faint whisper, almost like a sigh, 
echoing through the dark corridors of the basement. The sound was chilling, a soft murmur that seemed both very close, yet muffled by thick walls. Casey and Megan exchanged nervous glances, the thrill of adventure quickly turning into genuine fear. Did you hear that? Megan whispered, her voice barely audible. Yes, Casey replied, her grip tightening on her flashlight. Maybe we should... Before she could finish, another sound cut her off. It was a thud, something heavy hitting the ground above them. Then, footsteps, slow and deliberate, moving across the floor directly overhead. The girls froze, their earlier bravado fading into the cold realization that they were not alone. Heart pounding, Casey pointed her flashlight toward the stairs leading back up, half expecting to see something, or someone, appear. But there was only darkness, thick and silent. As they debated their next move, the temperature around them dropped sharply. Their breath became visible in the air, and the faint whisper returned, louder now a soft chanting that seemed to seep from the very walls around them. The words were indistinct, a language they couldn't understand, but the tone was unmistakable, a lament, a cry of despair and warning from the depths of the mansion's shadowy past. The terror mounting, Casey and Megan realized they needed to leave to escape the oppressive embrace of Fairwood Mansion. But as they turned ahead for the stairs, a loud crash echoed through the basement, blocking their path with debris. Trapped and terrified, they were left with no choice but to find another way out. The whispers growing louder around them as the mansion seemed to come alive with the restless spirits of its dark history. The story of their summer adventure had taken a horrifying turn, and as the shadows danced menacingly in the flicker of their flashlight beams, the true horror of Fairwood Mansion was just beginning to unfold. Trapped in the chilling basement of the Fairwood Mansion, Casey and Megan's initial excitement turned into a fight for composure and sanity. The oppressive darkness seemed to thicken with every passing second, and the whispers morphed into a cacophony of indistinct voices, pressing in on them from all sides. Each breath they took felt heavier than the last, the cold air piercing their lungs as they tried to think of a way out. Megan, usually the more composed of the two, grabbed Casey's arm tightly. We have to find another exit. There has to be another way out of this basement, she said, her voice trembling. They began to search the walls, their hands sliding over cold, damp stone, searching for any hint of a door or passageway. Their only source of light, the dim beams of their flashlights, created eerie shadows that played tricks on their eyes. As they moved, the remnants of the old library whispered secrets of a forgotten time, the soft rustle of pages adding to the eerie soundscape. Suddenly, Casey's flashlight beam caught something, an outline of a small hidden door almost completely obscured by a heavy curtain of cobwebs and dust. Here, Megan, look, she exclaimed, her voice a mix of hope and fear. They hurried to the door, pulling at it with anxious energy. It creaked ominously, but gave way to their efforts, opening into a narrow, dark tunnel that seemed to have been hidden from the world for decades, if not centuries. The air inside the tunnel was musty, filled with the smell of earth and mold, suggesting it might have been used as a secret escape route or a storage space long ago. Without a better option, and driven by a desperate need to escape the unnerving basement, they entered the tunnel. The passage was just wide enough for them to move in single file, and they proceeded with caution, the ground beneath their feet, uneven and treacherous. As they delved deeper into the tunnel, the noises from the mansion began to fade, replaced by the sound of their own labored breathing and the occasional drip of water echoing through the cramped space. The claustrophobic confines of the tunnel pressed close, the darkness almost tangible. Just as they began to feel a slight relief from the oppressive atmosphere of the mansion, they stumbled upon something unexpected. The tunnel widened into a small chamber. Their flashlights swept across the room, revealing walls lined with ancient symbols and faded murals, depicting scenes that sent chills down their spines. Dark rituals and haunting specters, each image more disturbing than the last. In the center of the chamber, a large stone pedestal held an old dust-covered book, its cover adorned with strange runes. The air around the book seemed to shimmer slightly, a visual distortion that made their heads spin if they looked too long. Megan, driven by curiosity and an overwhelming urge to understand, stepped forward and reached out to brush away the dust from the book's cover. 
As her fingers made contact, a sudden chill swept through the chamber, and the ground trembled beneath their feet. The murals on the walls seemed to come alive, the figures moving as if reenacting the rituals depicted in the paintings. Horrified, Casey pulled Megan back, but it was too late. The atmosphere had shifted, the chamber now filled with a palpable energy. The whispers returned, louder than before, and a voice clear and resonant echoed through the chamber, speaking in a language they could not understand but felt deep in their bones. The chamber's air grew colder, and the faint light from their flashlights flickered erratically as shadows began to dance along the walls, taking on forms that were too sinister to be mere tricks of the light. Trapped in this ancient chamber, with the only known exit leading back to the haunted mansion, Casey and Megan faced a terrifying realization. Their escape from the mansion had led them deeper into its darkest secrets, and the night was far from over. The echoes of the ancient, unintelligible incantations reverberated through the chamber, growing in intensity as the shadows danced more wildly against the rough stone walls. Casey and Megan clutched each other, their eyes wide with terror as they watched the murals come to life. The painted figures, spectral and ghostly, seemed to step out from the walls, their forms becoming semi-transparent apparitions that hovered just above the ground. The chamber's air thickened, suffocating them with its cold embrace as the figures surrounded them in a slow, menacing procession. The spectral forms were whispering now, their voices a chorus of despair and malice that made the girls' heads pound in agony. Megan, overwhelmed by fear, scrambled towards the book on the pedestal, her thoughts racing. She remembered stories of old spells and incantations that could ward off evil spirits. Desperate, she flipped open the ancient tome, her fingers trembling as she turned the dusty pages. Each page fluttered ominously, as if breathing a life of its own. As she searched for something, anything, that might help them, Casey tried to drag her away, urging, We need to leave now! But Megan was transfixed, her eyes scanning the cryptic text. Suddenly, the ground beneath them shook violently, a deep rumbling that seemed to come from the very bowels of the earth. Cracks spread across the chamber floor, and from these fissures, a ghastly bluish light emanated, casting a ghostly glow that intensified the haunting atmosphere. Megan's hand stopped on a page, her eyes catching a series of symbols that matched those etched into the stone around the pedestal. Without fully understanding what she was doing, driven by a compulsion beyond her own reasoning, she began to read aloud. The words felt alien, their sounds harsh and chilling as they left her lips. As she spoke, the spectral figures ceased their whispering and turned towards her, their eyes glowing with a baleful light. The air around Megan grew colder, and a wind whipped up within the chamber, howling through the tunnel behind them, the book's pages fluttering wildly in her hands. The chamber's atmosphere reached a crescendo of eerie energy as Megan's voice rose in desperation. Suddenly, with a deafening crack, the pedestal split in two, the ancient book plummeting into a newly opened crevasse in the earth below. The bluish light exploded outward, enveloping everything in an ethereal glow. In that instant, Casey and Megan felt an overwhelming force pull them towards the fissure. Their screams echoed off the stone walls, lost amidst the roar of the wind and the chilling sounds of the incantation still hanging in the air. They grasped for each other their fingers slipping away as they were inexorably drawn into the abyss below. And the last thing they saw before being swallowed by the darkness was the face of the spectral figures. Their expressions twisted into grotesque smiles, as if pleased with the chaos they had incited. Then, everything went black. Outside, the quarry resumed its stillness, the waters of Widow's Deep placid as if nothing had occurred. The old Fairwood Mansion stood silent against the backdrop of the night, its secrets buried once again, waiting for the next unwitting souls brave enough to uncover its dark past. The summer night reclaimed its peace, but at a terrible cost, as the legends of the haunted mansion grew even darker, fed by the fates of Casey and Megan, forever lost to the shadows of Fairwood. During a sweltering summer in the small town of Elmswood, Ella and her college friends decided to spend a weekend at the old Harrowick Campgrounds, a site tucked deep in the woods that had recently been reopened after years of abandonment. 
Rumors about why the camp was closed were varied, ranging from a management change to whispers of a darker, more sinister nature involving a series of unexplained disappearances decades earlier. Ella, a keen photographer and lover of folklore, was particularly drawn to the camp because of its eerie history. She convinced her friends, Sarah, Jake, and Chris, to join her for what she described as a thrilling adventure, not just a regular camping trip. They arrived on a bright, hot Friday afternoon, the sun casting dappled patterns through the thick canopy of trees that surrounded the camp. The site was more isolated than they had imagined, with only a few other campers visible in the distance. They set up their tents near a small, clear lake that reflected the sky like a mirror, the water still and inviting. As the day faded into evening, the group gathered around the campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. The light from the fire flickered across their faces, creating a cozy, if somewhat eerie, atmosphere. Ella decided this was the perfect time to recount the story of the heroic disappearances. According to local lore, Several campers went missing in the late 70s, with no trace ever found. The story suggested something unnatural in the woods, an entity that was part of the land itself, malevolent and protective of its territory. As Ella elaborated on the tales, her friends' expressions ranged from skeptical to uneasily intrigued. The night grew darker and the woods around them seemed to close in, the sounds of nature taking on a more sinister tone as they absorbed Ella's tales. After a few hours, they decided to turn in, the fire dying down to glowing embers. Sometime in the middle of the night, Ella awoke to a faint rustling sound outside her tent. Assuming it was one of her friends, she called out softly, but received no response. The rustling continued, accompanied by a subtle, inexplicable humming sound. Curious and a bit nervous, Ella grabbed her flashlight and slowly unzipped the tent. The campsite was bathed in moonlight, the shadows of the trees stretching like dark fingers across the ground. Ella's flashlight beam cut through the darkness as she searched for the source of the noises. What she found instead were small, strange markings around their campsite, not there before. A series of twisted, almost ritualistic symbols etched into the earth. Feeling a sudden chill, Ella called softly for her friends, her voice trembling slightly. One by one, they emerged from their tents, sleepy and confused. She showed them the markings, her concern evident. The group huddled together, trying to make sense of the discovery. As they debated what to do, the subtle humming grew louder, a mournful melody that seemed to come from the woods themselves. It was enchanting, almost hypnotic, and without realizing it, they found themselves drawn towards the lake, the sound guiding them like a siren's call. Standing at the lake's edge, they watched as the water began to ripple. The humming now clear and beautiful, yet filled with an underlying sorrow. The moonlight reflected off the water, and for a moment they saw something beneath the surface, a fleeting shadow, large and swift moving. Frozen with a mixture of awe and fear, they could only watch as the water suddenly stilled, the humming stopped, and a deep, oppressive silence fell over the camp. The air grew colder, and a dense fog began to roll in from the lake, enveloping them in a thick white shroud. As the fog surrounded them, their visibility diminished, and they realized they were no longer alone. Shapes moved in the fog, slow and deliberate, circling them, coming closer. The terror of their situation finally set in. Something had been awakened at Harrowick campgrounds, and the night was far from over. Their summer adventure had turned into a chilling ordeal, with the true horror yet to unfold. As the fog thickened, swallowing the dim light of the moon, the group huddled closer, their breath visible in the chill air. The shapes moving in the mist remained just out of clear sight, but their presence was palpable, a pressure that felt as if the air itself was heavy with watchful eyes. Ella, despite her fear, raised her camera, the lens a meager barrier between her and the unknown. She snapped pictures in quick succession, hoping to capture whatever lurked just beyond their vision. The camera's flash cut through the darkness, each burst briefly illuminating the dense fog with stark white light. Between flashes, the figures appeared closer, their forms more discernible. A procession of shadows, human-like but distorted, elongated limbs and gaunt faces that seemed to flicker in and out of existence with each pulse of light. The camera's clicking echoed unnervingly loud in the eerie silence that followed the ceased humming. 
Chris, trying to keep his voice steady, suggested they make their way back to the tents and gather their things to leave. No one protested. The unspoken agreement was that they needed to get away from the lake, away from the creeping fog and the haunting figures. As they turned to leave, a loud splash from the lake halted their movements. They spun around to see ripples spreading across the surface of the water, but the cause of the disturbance was not visible. The fog seemed to close in tighter, the temperature dropping as an overwhelming sense of urgency gripped them. Jake, the most practical of the group, broke the paralysis. Let's go now, he urged, grabbing his flashlight and leading the way back to the campsite. They moved quickly, almost running, the ground beneath their feet crunching with a harshness that amplified their desperate haste. Reaching their campsite, they found their tents enveloped in the same thick fog, which seemed to have followed them from the lake, or perhaps had spread to engulf the entire area. They packed with trembling hands, not speaking, each sound magnified, a zipper's rasp, the snap of a flashlight, their heavy breaths. With their gear hastily gathered, they began the trek back to their parked car, which was parked a good half mile away through dense woods. The path, familiar during the day, now seemed alien and treacherous under the cloak of night and fog. As they navigated the winding trail, the silence was oppressive, suffocating. Then, breaking the stillness, a soft voice whispered through the trees, barely audible over the crunch of their footsteps. It was singing, the same haunting melody that had emanated from the lake, but now it was clearer and undeniably sorrowful. The singing seemed to surround them, coming from all directions. Flashlights scanned the fog, but there was nothing to see, only the dense white mist that seemed to absorb the light, rendering it useless. The path became more difficult to follow, the familiar markers and trail signs swallowed by the fog. With each step, the singing grew louder, more insistent. Panic began to set in as they realized that the path they were following was no longer leading them back to the car, but seemed to be looping back towards the lake. Each turn, each landmark was disorientingly similar to the last, as if they were walking in circles. Exhausted, frightened, and cold, they stopped to regroup, trying to use their phones for GPS, but to their dismay, there was no signal, the screens showing only the searching icon spinning endlessly. They were lost, disoriented by the deceptive fog and the mesmerizing, omnipresent singing that now seemed to be drawing them deeper into the woods towards an unknown fate. As they stood, unsure and afraid, the fog began to part slightly, revealing glimpses of the lake through the trees. Their circuitous path had led them right back to where they had started. The realization dawned on them with chilling clarity. Something within Harrowick campgrounds didn't want them to leave. The summer night's adventure had turned into a nightmare, and their ordeal was far from over, ensnared by the haunting melody and the mysterious forces of the old, forgotten camp. As they stood on the verge of the lake, encircled by the dissipating fog and the omnipresent melody, a collective dread settled over them. The air was thick with despair, each note of the haunting song tugging deeper at their spirits, pulling them closer to the water's dark, reflective surface. Something's not right. We shouldn't have ended up back here, Chris murmured, his voice a mix of fear and frustration. It's like, it's like we're being herded. Ella, her fingers numb around her camera, continued to document their ordeal, hoping that somehow the images captured would make sense of this madness later. If there was a later. Each flash illuminated the stark terror on her friends' faces, creating fleeting islands of light in a sea of darkness. The singing intensified, no longer just a distant melody, but a clear, lyrical voice that resonated across the lake, vibrating through the very ground they stood on. As they listened, paralyzed by a mix of fear and hypnotic compulsion, the water began to stir. Gentle ripples grew into turbulent waves, splashing against the shore with increasing ferocity. We need to leave now, Jake shouted over the roar of the water. He grabbed Ella's arm, pulling her away from the hypnotic pull of the lake. They turned to run, only to see that the path they had come through was now shrouded in an impenetrable wall of mist. The water's edge seemed to creep closer, encroaching on the land as if the lake itself was alive, reaching out to them with wet, grasping fingers. In a panic, they ran along the shore, searching for any gap in the fog, any path that might lead away from the increasingly aggressive lake. Suddenly, from the midst of the water, a massive, shadowy figure rose. The moonlight glinted off its slick, wet skin, a creature of the lake, large and looming, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. 
Its presence was overwhelming, a primal entity awakened from the depths, its form obscured by the splashing waves and mist. The creature let out a sound, a deep, bellowing cry that chilled their blood and shook the air around them. The ground trembled beneath their feet, and for a moment, the entire forest seemed to respond to its call. Frozen in place, the group could only watch in horror as the creature moved closer to shore, its size becoming more apparent, its form more terrifying. It was not just a creature of flesh and blood, but seemed made of water itself, a guardian of the lake, ancient and unstoppable. As it approached, the singing reached a crescendo, a powerful force that seemed to command them to stay, to listen, to succumb. Their minds fogged with fear and confusion, they found themselves stepping closer to the water, their bodies no longer their own to control. Just as they reached the water's edge, where the foam kissed their feet, the creature lunged forward. Its massive form crashed through the shallow water, reaching for them with arms that spanned the width of the lake. In a matter of seconds, the dark waters enveloped them, dragging them down into the cold, suffocating depths of the lake. The last thing they saw were the stars above, twinkling indifferently in the night sky, as the water filled their lungs and the song of the lake lulled them into a dark, eternal embrace. The night at Harrowick Campgrounds ended not with screams, but with a song, a melody that would continue to haunt the lake, waiting for the next unwary souls to listen. Thank you for listening. Now watch this video, 